um, it's, it's, as you all know, just extraordinarily uh, timely and fundamental. Our guest was appointed or nominated to his current position on uh, the 11th of September 2001, uh, a day on which probably nonproliferation um, took on a new meaning with the possibility that proliferation could lead to the use of weapons by substates as well as major actors, groups not subject to deterrence as we've lived with for so long. Uh, so that is uh, certainly maybe not a, a major change in, re in, uh, in theory, but certainly in terms of our perception, it's an enormous change. And running under most of our concerns of the moment with Iraq and North Korea and other circumstances is the question, of course, of proliferation. And uh, we're absolutely delighted tonight that we're being joined by uh, a gentleman who lives with this problem daily. Uh, a thought that may not please him as much as it does for us, since we have the possibility of benefiting from his wisdom. But we're absolutely delighted at that. Ambassador John Stern Wolf is a graduate of Dartmouth College. Uh, I remarked to him, and he played squash at Dartmouth, so I feel free in saying this. But I watched the Dartmouth squash team this weekend, um, and they're marvelous. They're, they're number five in the country, and I, I watched the full match of their number one player who's uh, uh, number two in the country. But I, I was struck by the excellence of, uh, of his play. It was really just an absolutely extraordinary uh, uh, performance. But I mention that not to get on the subject of squash, but just to use the theme of excellence in respect to our, our, the awards that indeed our guest has gotten. He's, he, he twice has received the President's uh, uh, Meritorious Service Award both 1992 and the year 2000. He's received the uh, Cobb Award in the State Department for uh, uh, initiatives and success in international trade. And he's also received the annual award of the, uh, I think it's the American, uh, the Pacific uh, uh, Economic Council of the American Chambers of Commerce. And he also, early in his career, uh, went to the Woodrow Wilson School uh, at Princeton, which of course is honorific as, as well. In his early career, he served in Australia and uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, Greece, and uh, more recently, he uh, has held a series of positions which I think are of, 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 of significance. He was Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, International Organizations. He uh, has served as, uh, with the, uh, as ambassador to Malaysia from 92 to 95, and he was our coordinator for uh, Asian Pacific Econ the Economic Council uh, cooperation, and then became America's ambassador to APEC. He uh, then served uh, as a special advisor to the president and the secretary of state for Caspian uh, Basin economic diplomacy and then, of course, was appointed to his current position in 2001. Uh, I think this will be a fascinating evening. It's my great pleasure to present Ambassador John Stern Wolf. Thank you very much. Um, gee, I guess hearing that thanks to the Lockheed Corporation makes me makes me remember the money that I've been losing to their executives down in Washington when we play golf. <laughs> so I feel like I'm contributing to this as well. <laughs> and um, we'll have to decide whether the Northrop contribution in putting this on tape is, is, is worthwhile later. Anyway, thank you for that introduction. And when I hear it, it always reminds me that, that I have had a number of jobs that I must have left undone because I keep coming back to a number of issues time after time. International Organization of, of Pakistan from 1984 to 1987, well, it was a we had problems then in South Asia, and we have problems now in South Asia, and many of them are the same, but just a little worse. And International Organization Affairs from 1989 to 1992, you all might remember um, August 1st, 1990. Well, I can tell you, I can't quite tell you what the result was, but I remember I was just down the street at Camden Yard. 
and when I went back down to um, uh, Chevy Chase Circle and turned my radio on for the first time, I think maybe the Orioles lost, and that's why I had the radio off. But when I turned it on and heard that we had called for a Security Council meeting because of Iraq's invasion of uh, Kuwait, that was a kind of focusing event because I was then in charge. I was acting assistant secretary, and that led to a whole series of things. I'll talk about Iraq tonight because it certainly is a focal point. But I'd like to, first of all, though, talk more broadly about uh, U.S. efforts to combat the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. I suppose I'd like to talk about the broad framework in, in questions and answers. You all may be interested in some of the specifics of Iraq, Iran, North Korea, uh, others. Our, our fight against weapons of mass destruction is, is really um, a core part of President Bush's national security policy. Um, I think what I'll do is start with nuclear proliferation, then look a bit at the changing international scene, and then i talk briefly about uh, the challenges and the tools we use to combat the challenges of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons and the means of their deliveries, largely that's missiles. You know, during the first 40 years after World War II, we and our allies used deterrence, and we uh, used tight export controls to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. And I think looking back, things seemed much easier to manage at that time. But perhaps that's because the Cold War and, and our standoff with the Soviet Union tended to supersede all other things. However, in the 10 years since the end of the Cold War, much has changed. Our challenges have multiplied, and frankly, the situation has not gotten better. In the early days, uh, in the six, starting in the 60s, we promoted a nuclear nonproliferation treaty. It was then, and it remains, at the cornerstone of U.S. nonproliferation policy. Uh, we sought to forge an international consensus that would hold nuclear proliferation to the five nuclear powers. Uh, we tried to establish uh, controls over sensitive technologies. Today, we worry about a whole list, a growing list, of what I call the nuclear wannabes. But even as we worry about that, I'd like to stop for a second to say we can take some great satisfaction in what the NPT has achieved. There are 188 members of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. I'm still counting North Korea. There are only three countries outside, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Most of the 188 have made irrevocable decisions to forego nuclear weapons. And several states like uh, South Africa, Brazil, and Argentina had nuclear weapons programs, and they turned back. Other states, states of the former Soviet Union, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and the Ukraine had nuclear weapons, and they gave them up. They chose not to maintain their, their nuclear weapon status, and that's an important step for, for the international community. But there are a few others within the NPT, notably Iraq, North Korea, and Iran, but also several others in the Middle East, in North Africa, who seem determined to cheat on their obligations. They are the active targets of our nonproliferation and counterproliferation policies. And we need to get this right, because failure to stop nuclear proliferation uh, would profoundly change U.S. and allied def uh, defense and deterrence policies. I view uh, the developments in South Asia as a signal setback for global nonproliferation. The decision by India and Pakistan to acquire and in 1998 test weapons was, hurt our, our efforts around the world. Far from promoting stability in South Asia, these weapons raise the stakes enormously. There's a direct threat to the billion plus people who live in South, 1.1 billion people or more who live in South Asia. And I guess just as worrisome, perhaps more, is the risk that the technologies or fissile material that they have uh, could be kept compromised. And we've had an active discussion with both India and Pakistan 
concerning the importance of effective chains of command uh, and secure storage of sensitive materials and facilities. And I guess with some, some effect, both India and Pakistan have in, 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 in recent weeks announced new ways uh, to, to uh, institutionalize the chain of command. And, and that's an important step forward. It's not enough, but it, it helps. Globally, the proliferation threat is real, and it's getting worse. If we look at weapons of mass destruction, our focus is on both supply and demand. We concentrate particularly on the rogue regimes, those regimes that disregard international norms, their commitments under treaties, uh, whose governments are hostile to us, to our way of life, uh, and everything we believe in. We know, we know they seek nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. We are increasingly conscious that their threat is compounded by their links and their active support, links to and active support for international terrorist groups who would use mass weapons not just against us or our allies, but against civilian targets, against civilian targets all around the world. With globalization, there are more suppliers and countries that were previously buyers are now in, the now in the position also to sell. They sell for money. Sometimes they sell for ideology. But the fact is they increase the supply of dangerous technologies on the marketplace. Another problem with curbing supply is the ambivalent approach of many of our allies and friends in Europe and in parts of Asia. <laughs> While combating proliferation is for us, as I said, a central part of our foreign policy and our national security policy, in many other countries, for the public and for, for many of their officials, the spread of weapons of mass destruction appears to be just one of many issues that they trade off. They balance against and trade off, too often for trade, I suppose. We clearly see a threat. They're from real countries with real names and real capabilities, and they pose real security threats to us, to our friends, and to our allies. Iraq, as the President said as recently as last evening, is a unique threat, and one that the President is determined to see ended. Since his brutal rise to power, Saddam Hussein has proven himself a menace to the region, to the people of Iraq. For 12 years, he's defied the international community, by the UN's reckoning, he's failed to take account of materials that he procured in order to make biological weapons in enormous quantities, sufficient to kill millions of people. He's failed to show any evidence that these materials have been destroyed. Defectors have told us he's built a variety of missile, missile systems. Um, they've told us that he's built several mobile weapons labs, weapons labs designed to hide production from inspections. He's never disclosed those labs and he's shown no evidence that they've been destroyed. He's failed to account for large numbers of chemical munitions. They admitted to having them in the, in, in the early 90s. They deny having them now. We know based on, on international inspections that Iraq had a nuclear weapons design. We know it had an effort to acquire enrichment capability. Since the departure of the inspectors, we've seen ominous procurement in the region and around the world. And they suggest to us persuasively that Saddam Hussein continues his quest for a nuclear bomb. He's offered no credible explanation for these activities. Well, the Security Council in Resolution 1441 passed in November gave Saddam one last chance to disarm and comply with the other requirements of the 16 resolutions that were passed in the years from 1991 till 2002. We've worked very closely with the UN inspections. I speak almost weekly with either or both Dr. Dr. Blix of the um, UN inspection team, Dr. Albarity of the International Atomic Energy Agency. We are providing an abundance of intelligence and other support to the inspectors. And they found secret files in a private home. And they found mustard gas precursors. 
and they have found an extensive prohibited missile program and abundant proof that Iraq has been smuggling into a, has, that Iraq has been smuggling in WMD materials and components, and it is continuing to do so even as the inspections continue. With four years to prepare, they've hidden things all over Iraq. So although the inspectors have made some progress and some important discoveries, there are 108 of them and they're searching for a needle in a haystack, as the President said, in a state, in a, in a country the size of California. They didn't go there to turn over every rock. They went there to help verify peaceful disarmament. And yet Iraq has used all manner of subterfuge uh, to prevent that process from going forward. He's not disarming. He is deceiving. He's holding fast to his dreams of conquest and regional domination. We want to see peaceful disarmament, um, but the time for that is fast running out. Lest all of this is kind of abstract, you know, chemical weapons, biological weapons, let me try and narrow the narrow the perspective for just a moment. Now, I'm not flacking for Tom Clancy or his book or the movie, It's Some of All Fears, or, it's vivid, you know, or that vivid movie portrayal of Raven Stadium, which many of you may have seen. But the image of a nuclear device going off at uh, Raven Stadium is a pretty gripping il illustration of what we're talking about. And if a biological weapon, such as Clostridium Perfringens. Believe me, that's close to the end. If it went off at Fells Point under proper conditions, then people in Federal Hill and in Patterson Park would soon develop severe lung damage, leading to pulmonary endema and respiratory failure. And by the way, Iraq has declared that it produced some 3,400 liters of this gas, although inspectors have so far been unable to find any. And if it were mustard gas, and Iraq had hundreds of missing, unaccounted for mustard gas shells, such a weapon if set off in Charles Village, I am told, would affect Baltimoreans from Highland Town to Camden Yards. People who would inhale the vapor would, de would develop severe respiratory tract infection. And those who would ingest it would experience vomiting, damage to the eyes, a variety of other things that aren't pleasant. It's not pretty. And there is no antidote. So some would ask why disarming Iraq is important. And I would say because it's ties to terrorists, it's, dem it's demonstrated use of its weapons, its hostility to us and what we stand for, all make this an immediate danger that we cannot flinch away from yet again, as the world has since 1991. And some would ask, why Iraq, not North Korea? And I would say that the facts are simply different, and different countries, different geograph geographies, a different constellation of, of, of countries working the problem. Um, and so our policies should be different, too. But I guess I would also say that in both cases, our preferred path is peaceful. And while it may be hard for some to swallow, it is true that in both paths, our preferred path is multilateral. Yes, President Bush is the multilateralist. And that, and that from a, an administration which is too often um, stigmatized as unilateralist. We are working with our friends and allies, Japan, Korea, uh, Russia, China, the European Union, other members of France, the UK, trying to find a peaceful and multilateral solution uh, to the North Korean nuclear weapons issue. But our goal has to be and will remain denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Iran is another proliferation problem, both for its programs and for the risk of onward proliferation. We've worked hard to break Russia's WMD technology supply relationship. Discussions 
whether at the level of the President with President Putin, or the level of the Secretary of State and Foreign Minister Ivanov, or at the level of John Wolf and Mikhail uh, Lyshenko, they've still not gone far enough. Um, to date, we've talked a lot, but Russia has not taken the action is, that is necessary to stop its entities from supplying critical technologies to Iran. And it's not just Russia. It's China. It's Western Europe. The leakage has come from a variety of places. Previously secret Iranian nuclear activities were unmasked this summer by an Iranian exile group that alleged two secret nuclear facilities. One, um, an enrichment facility. The other, a heavy water production facility. Neither of these are consistent with the light water reactor that the Iranians are building with Russian assistance. We, have, we understand the International Atomic Energy Agency will be following up soon with Iran concerning these allegations and the apparent safeguards problems or safeguards violations that, that they would seem to portend. Now, in the face of challenges like these, what's missing? Well, for me, what's missing in today's international debate is any sense of passion, any sense of outrage. We have global standards of acceptable conduct, rules and, and laws, and they're being violated by countries who are creating increasingly threatening capabilities, and we can't solve it by ourselves. These capabilities are all the more horrific because, of, because the people who are developing them have an absolute disdain for the standards, for freedom, for democracy, for human rights, and have close ties to terrorist states. When I was in India several months in, in September, I said, you know, I think I was talking about one of the countries I just mentioned. They fear um, democracy, the rule of law, pluralistic societies. And they're focused on us. But tomorrow, guess what, New Delhi? Guess who they may be focused on next? That's something the Indians hadn't thought about. But as I say, where's the passion in all of this? Well, that's a bit of the problem. Uh, I don't want to just stand here and talk about the problem, so I'm going to talk about we have some solutions and we're working on them. It's axiomatic that one can't build a nuclear weapon unless one has phys fissile material, and the most fissile material in the world is in Russia. And it comes from their, 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 their nuclear programs over uh, nearly, fi uh, nearly 50 years, and, and now their disassembly of nuclear weapons. Thus, a key part of our nonproliferation policies for nearly a decade has related to the hundreds of tons, hundreds of tons of such materials that are present mainly in Russia, but also in the former Soviet Union. We're spending nearly a billion dollars, and next year we're going to propose $1.3 billion to secure, to improve security at Russian storage facilities to consolidate into a fewer areas fissile material, to stop new production. Think of it. In Russia, they're producing two tons of new plutonium a year. I can't even begin to tell you how many weapons that would make. And we are purchasing or blending down nuclear, fissile nuclear fuels into things that are more proliferation, uh, uh, non -prolifer harder to proliferate, and usable in commercial reactors. The group of eight leaders um, at their economic summit last summer in Kananaskis embraced an initiative that would widen support for the kinds of programs we've been doing for 10 years to include Europe and Japan. Uh, I was at a meeting Monday a week ago, and I pointed out that in any one year, take last year, we spent more than all the rest of the countries in that room had spent in 10 years, and the free lunch is over, and it's time for them to chip in, and their leaders agreed. So we're moving forward with that. Now, I talked a few minutes ago about some of our differences with Europe. 
Uh, I have said a lot to them. I think we spend a lot too much time talking about the architecture. Yeah, are we going to talk about the treaties and the regimes and the laws and the this and that? And they're always telling us, you know, you're not giving enough support to treaties and, you know, you pull out of this and you do that and you're weakening. You're weakening um, the system. And I say, yes, these agreements, agreements like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Chemical Weapons Treaty, the Biological Weapons Treaty, the multilateral regimes like the Australia Group, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, the, the Missile Technology Control Regime, these are, and the, 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 the uh, nuclear suppliers, they, they, these are all important parts of what we need. Um, they are all important in terms of setting international norms and helping us to establish how we will operate nationally. Uh, they're important, for instance, in giving um, a, legal, a, a legal backing for the International Atomic Energy Agency, one of the really important UN agencies that, whose job is to provide confidence to all of us that peaceful nuclear, that, that, that nuclear power can be used peacefully. But once you get past the debate about architecture, the real question is, what are we doing in terms of concrete action to make proliferation more costly politically and financially? We can work to make the regime st stronger, and we clearly have more to do, and we've been doing that over the last few years. But the regimes are not enough. Most are voluntary agreements. They, most aren't legally binding, and what are you going to do? Who are you going to take it to? We need stronger enforcement. Proliferators need to know that they face isolation and consequences when their efforts continue. Ending the threat posed by Iraq's weapons of mass destruction will help to send a powerful message to proliferators that the world community will not tolerate this any longer. And North Korea must not imagine that it can blackmail the international community nor the United States. We've spoken as one on this. As Secretary Powell said, we stand ready to develop a different kind of a relationship with North Korea once Pyongyang comes into verifiable compliance with its commitments. The North must be willing to act in a manner that builds trust. And I would note that even as this difference remains, we continue to be the largest supplier of humanitarian assistance to North Korea, although there's some problems there. Tightening regimes, improved enforcement are part of the answer. Many countries are telling us about their new export controls. China is, is, is busy um, these months telling us about their new missile, chemical, biological controls. But having controls and having laws is not nearly as important as enforcing controls and enforcing their laws. And it is enforcement by which we judge countries' conduct, not the mere passage of laws. Well, where controls fail, we have another option, and that's interdiction. It's not a panacea, but properly planned and executed interdiction, either working with others or working alone, can make it more difficult for end users, lengthen the amount of time, create uncertainty uh, for buyers and sellers, and make, just make it that much more expensive and difficult. And, and where countries or entities in their countries, businesses choose to sell to proliferators, then they face the real risk of sanctions. There are 19 laws that I'm charged with patrolling that would impose sanctions against individual entities and countries for sale of, of items that would contribute to various kinds of weapons of mass destruction. And we have made clear, including to our European friends and allies, that your companies have to make a choice. You can sell, for instance, to a pharmaceutical company in Iran, or you can sell here in the United States, but you can't do both. And that works. And we have positive measures, as I mentioned. We're working closely with the Russians and the Kazakhs. We're working with all of the countries of the former Soviet Union on export controls. I have. Um, nearly $250 million in programs that work on export controls, that 
that provide technology, portal monitors, and training, and work on, 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 on improving legal regimes, uh, money that can be used to destroy uh, SCUD missiles, as in the case of Bulgaria, or to immobilize uh, plutonium, as in the case of Kazakhstan. And we're working on all of these, and we look, we, we're, we've spread out a lot of our work over the, over, the, over the decade of the 90s was in Russia and the former Soviet Union. We're spreading out to South Asia, Southeast Asia. We have projects to deal with, with controlling radioactive sources, the kinds of things that could make radioactive weapons. It's the dynamite that kills, but the radioactive material that, that is kind of, that, that creates a kind of pollution and it's kind of a terror weapon. Anyway, we have projects in, in the Caribbean and, and, and and Central America because these radioactive sources are everywhere where you have medicine and where you have agriculture and, and they need to be protected. Summing up, we're all partners. Countries around the world need to be partners in a worldwide effort to make the world safer. It's an interlocking challenge and it doesn't work because proliferators will always take advantage of the adage the chain's only as strong as the weakest link. The President describes some of this in his State of the Union address, but you can also get clear his, the importance he places on it because this was the first national security decision directive had to do with, with organizing and combating um, proliferation. Our challenges are multiple and they're multiplying. We need to focus on the core issues we need to take action. Enhancing our dialogue with the worldwide partners is an essential part of this, but dialogue isn't a substitute for action. And where dialogue fails, we will find other means. We will use multilateral means where they work. We will use plurilateral means where they are available. And we will take unilateral action where it is necessary to safeguard our national interests. That was at the heart of President Bush's national security strategy that was, that was published last December. There are, I learned when I went out to Malaysia, I spent a lot of time with the business community. And I said, well, what do I, you know, my, my boss has told me, go out and be a problem solver. And he answered, they answered back uniformly. That's the trouble with you people. You're always look, you're always you're problem solver, problem, you're, you know what the problem with a problem solver is? Where you don't have problems, you create them and try and solve them. You want to be an opportunity creator. You want to go create opportunities and realize them. Well, in this job, I have realized there are a lot of opportunities to solve problems. And that's the challenge we face every day. Thank you. I'd be delighted to answer questions. The first question, who do you blame for people having weapons of mass destruction? But the second question is, is a geopolitical one, really. And that is, uh, why shouldn't a sovereign country, having certain needs, like Iraq does, uh, have nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction? And uh, who's going to determine that who should have them? Well, I, I think I'd rather take on the, the second question than the first question, because why tyrants decide that they're going to, you know, try nuclear, try chemical weapons against their people, why they choose to, to, to experiment with, with their own populations, why they, why they acquire these things, why they have ties to international terrorist groups that will only come back to bite them uh, is, is a decision that, that is, is, is non-transparent, uh, I guess, to stay in power. But the, the, the second question about who is to determine, and, and there the architecture is important. The architecture that's set by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Chemical Weapons Treaty, Biological Weapons Treaty, a variety of other um, commitments, including the UN Charter, all of these things are, they're, they're, they're commitments that are freely entered into. Obviously, um, there are benefits for, for signing up and there are penalties, perhaps just economic, 
for not signing up. If you're not a member of the Chemical Weapons Convention, you, there's certain kinds of trade that, that you just can't be a party to because you, you haven't committed to use um, chemical precursors in, in an agreed way. And the same with nuclear. If you're not, if you're not a member of the NPT, if you don't agree to have safeguards uh, patrolled by the IAEA, then there's more or less a consensus among nuclear suppliers not to sell nuclear technology. Now that breaks down by exception. Russia still sells to <coughs> Russia still sells to um, to India, which is not a member of the NPT and doesn't and doesn't have the kind of full scope safeguards that the that the nuclear suppliers groups say is important. But I mean, there are there there are carrots and there are sticks. But once having once having committed, once having joined, it is, it is not acceptable, and it is a threat to us all when countries covertly seek to undermine their obligations. And we're determined, as an international community, not as us, uh, not as the United States, we're determined to patrol those lines. That's the threat. The threat from North Korea with nuclear weapons is not a threat just at the United States. It's a threat to Japan and South Korea. It's a big threat to China because the, the, the regional implications of a nuclear armed North Korea uh, have to have them lying awake a lot at night thinking about it. And the threat of a nuclear armed Iraq or Iran in a region as vital as the Middle East and that part of Asia is, is not acceptable to its neighbors, and it's really not acceptable to us. Uh, so we, and the fact that these countries have such close ties to terrorist groups means that we can't rule out that fissile material, an assembled weapon, biological weapon, um, precursors that, I mean, it's not very hard to take the basic elements of a biological weapon, pack it, transport it, reconstitute it, and use it. And that's one of the, that's one of, there's been a real convergence. We, we've recognized the convergence between the threats abroad and our homeland security. We, the work that we do on export controls and portal monitors and all those other things, really that's the first line of defense. What we stop moving from Russia to Kazakhstan, from Kazakhstan through the Caspian. Um, that's why, but it, but that's why I also wanted to talk about the implications for Baltimore, if, if, if we don't, if it doesn't work, because it's not some distant threat. It's not just about whether Iraq has the right to fight its enemies. The question is whether Iraq's going to have a weapon that they're going to set off at, um, down on um, Pr Pratt Avenue, Pratt Street. The question or the observation was that unilateralism doesn't make friends. Uh, please comment on the, the president's policy. Well, I, I agree that unilateralism doesn't necessarily make friends, but it does protect. It, it may protect you. But I want to go back to the, your to your starting point. President Bush has talked about nonproliferation from day one. It's been a cardinal part of his national security policy. We have worked in a variety of ways to build a coalition of countries in multilateral fora all, all around the world who are joined together in the idea that we are going to stop the spread of dangerous weapons, the precursors, the materials that would be used to make them. I think if you did a more careful search, use, just put the word nonproliferation into without advertising for Google, just put nonproliferation into, in, 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 into a computer and, and google.com and you will find thousands of pages of references, including by a whole host of officials in the Bush administration, because we talk about it all the time. If you think about it, his speech September 12th to the United Nations General Assembly was all about building the international consensus to support the basic tenets of nonproliferation, peaceful disarmament. And I will stand here and tell you with absolute conviction, 
I, you know, I don't know what's in, I mean, can't, I don't know what's in his heart, but I, I am convinced and I'm just believe, I have good reason to believe he's not made a decision to go to war. He wants a peaceful solution. He wants a peaceful solution to Iraq. The last thing he wants to do is commit U.S. military forces, but he is prepared to commit U.S. military forces if it's necessary to achieve the disarmament objective. If he does, we won't be alone. Does the United States' reluctance to be a part of certain treaties complicate the nonproliferation work? Well, it, it, it makes for a much more animated discussion about the architecture, I'm sure. And, and so we got into a big argument with our European friends about the Biological Weapons Convention and whether or not it was possible to come up with monitoring that worked. And we do have a view about treaties. We want to join treaties that work. We want to join treaties that are effective. We don't want to join treaties simply to join treaties. We don't think that any treaty is better than no treaty. Um, we put forward a treaty. The Senate will consider it shortly, the Moscow Treaty to reduce nuclear weapons. And we are in the process of ratifying the additional protocol for, um, as part of our commitments in the International Atomic Energy Agency. There are a variety, of, we're, we're working on a, on a treaty, a convention, uh, that would deal with the transportation of conventional, uh, of nuclear fuel for conventional, in, 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 in the private sector, non-military transport of nuclear materials. But we look very carefully at each one. Comprehensive test ban treaty is one where, where it was not, I mean, it was considered during the uh, Clinton administration <coughs> and there were 99 votes against it. We haven't sent it back up because we're not confident that you could come up with one that protects U.S. national interests over a sustained period of time. It's not that we plan to test, our, test nuclear weapons, but we have nuclear weapons for a purpose. And I will tell you that every one of our allies, including the ones who say, hey, gee, you know, sign the CTBT, every one of those friends and allies is glad to know that we have those nuclear weapons <laughs> for the extremist case, and that's what they're there for, um, that extremist case. But for the president, he has to be able to know that if he ever has to use them, they need to work. And sometime out there, we reserve the right, even though we don't choose to exercise the right, we reserve the right to test. But we've been very clear, we're not gonna test. We haven't tested for years. We don't expect to test for years. And that's, that's our position. Oh, we wish that others weren't testing. We wish the Indians and the Pakistanis had not tested in 1998. That's the real, I mean, those are the real kinds of problems. From the President's speech last night, perhaps North Korea can be accommodated, and he seems to take the position that uh, Iraq cannot. Would you comment on that? We're trying to find a peaceful, diplomatic solution to both, to both cases. But the world community has been trying for a dozen years, 11 years, oh, nearly a dozen years, to end the, the WMD programs in Iraq. I was asked today by, at the Foreign Press Center in Washington, well, would we give them a final, final opportunity? And I said, well, gee, you know, if you say final opportunity, do you mean it? Or is there a final, final opportunity? And I said, well, frankly, you know, if you think about it from Resolution 687 through the 16 resolutions that the world has passed since 1991, you'd really have to say it's the final, 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 you know, 16 times final. And we're going to give them one more chance as if that will make a difference. Dr. Blix said on Monday, there is no sign that in Baghdad they've made a genuine decision to disarm. We didn't say it, he said it. And that's the case. And 1441 had one test disarmament, 
one goal, disarmament, and two tests. A declaration, full, current, and accurate. And a second test, cooperation. They failed the declaration test on December 7th. Nobody, except for perhaps the Iraqis, nobody doubts that that was a 12,000-page 12, 12, rehash of old information and new lies. They failed that test. And on Monday, we didn't say it, the chief inspector said they're still not cooperating. They're cooperating on process. They're letting us through the gates. But they're not letting us use surveillance aircraft. They're not letting us interview people privately. They, they have failed to account for VX and sarin and mustard gas. They're conducting a, a, a ballistic missile program that would appear to be a violation of Resolution 687. And they're continuing to purchase. They're continuing to smuggle things in from abroad to support those weapons of mass destruction programs, even while inspections are underway. So our belief is time is short. The possibility is still there. Peaceful solution is our preference. But disarmament is the goal. Now, North Korea is a little different. It's, it's much, it, it doesn't have oil. It's economically more vulnerable. There is a strong, there is a strong consensus among its neighbors that, that, the North, that, that the Korean Peninsula should be denuclearized. We're trying to use diplomacy. We're going to play this one out step by step. We'll see where it goes. Uh, it's just a different, different country, different place, different set, different set of factors. But in that one, we want a peaceful solution as well. The question is, how urgent is, in your view, is the North Korean threat? And uh, would you comment about how we're wrestling with that problem? Well, we're down in the mud, um, but no, it's an urgent problem. It's a big problem. The consequences of a nuclear of, of a nuclear armed North Korea are are real. It's worth noting that even while the last administration uh, was busy negotiating further agreements on the possibility of enhanced or uh, improved diplomatic relations missile curtailment, um, big aid packages, and, and the like, that the North Koreans were busy violating the agreed framework from 1994. They were out in the marketplace buying all of the components for their enrichment facility. And at the same time, they were continuing to conduct nuclear weapons development, high explosive testing, and the like. And they were selling missiles to the whole world. Um, when President Bush came, there was a step back. There, were, there was a reluctance to continue to engage on the terms that the Clinton administration engaged on because there was a worry that we were paying, paying with the one hand, and they were deceiving with both hands. And we, we took some time, and I will admit the, the interagency process didn't come smoothly and efficiently to a solution about how to proceed. But we had one last summer. And, and the president decided that we were going to try a bold approach with North Korea, an approach which was designed to, to seek a transformed bilateral relationship, where for, for a variety of substantial changes in, in the way North Korea engaged with the outside world, we would be prepared to provide significant um, benefits, starting with the integration of North Korea into the world community, from which it has been alienated for you know, decades. But as we were launching on that, and it was only as we were launching on that last summer, we, 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 intelligence developed information, not about a pilot scale enrichment program, which I guess we had, been know, we had known about for some number of years, but about wholesale purchases in the world market of the things that were necessary to build um, cent centrifuges, a production scale uh, enrichment facility. And so when Assistant Secretary Kelly went to Pyongyang in October, item one on the agenda was, whoa. 
we have this information, this is a serious impediment. Unless we deal with this impediment, it's difficult to get to the kind of bold, 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 bold approach, transform relationship that we're talking about. It has to be built on some foundation of trust. And to our great surprise, they actually admitted it and more. There were three translators, three fluent native-speaking Korean translators in the room. This wasn't a misinterpretation. Uh, maybe it was a misspoke, but it wasn't, a mis it wasn't misinterpreted. And, and the succession of events from then have kind of been um, of North Korea's own making. We are grappling with it. We are working closely in the TCOG, which is our trilateral relationship with, with uh, Korea and, and, and Japan. This trilateral group met a couple of weeks ago. We are in constant contact with, with Beijing and Moscow and the European Union. We had three people consulting in Asia, three senior level people uh, consulting in Asia and Russia over the last two weeks. The Secretary of State is on the phone with, with um, Foreign Minister Ivanov and with Foreign Minister Tang and with um, the Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, he, he talks every day to Jack Straw, so the British. But this, is, th th this isn't out there being ignored. It's just that we're trying to work it diplomatically. We're trying to keep the world community united. We're trying to make sure that the North Koreans don't exploit differences between us. We're trying to make sure that it's clear to Pyongyang that this is not an issue between the United States and North Korea. This is an issue between North Korea and the rest of the world. If we, if we can break through that, there's probably a path to settle it. Yeah, there, are se there are several questions there. And the, and the one is a, a repeat of the uh, first question, that is, uh, indeed, you, you've underlined why can't nations uh, provide for their own security in ways in which they think is best. In ways in and, which we think is best, in, in exactly the ways that we're doing it. Well, can't they do the same thing that we can? That, that's at the heart of the proliferation question as to whether all countries should be allowed to have all things. And you're raising the question, why not? Why can't everybody have all these weapons? And uh, And then you've raised the uh, first question being, uh, isn't it, uh, why are we upset about uh, uh, Iraq on the question of scientists? That would be treason. Uh, we wouldn't expect our scientists to behave in that way. Uh, I think those are the two main And, and, and the dues. I got the dues. And the dues, and we're, we're hypocritical. <laughs> got the dues. OK, well, let's, let's start with, with the interview question. First of all, I don't think you would accept I don't think the people of Baltimore would accept. I don't think the people of Maryland would accept. And I know the people of the United States wouldn't accept. Um, a government that subverted the rights of its citizens the way the Saddam Hussein regime has. I don't think the, United, the, the people of the United States would accept a government which gassed its own people experiment it with its own people, gassed, no, gassed its neighbors. So, so after 12 years, after 12 years of defiance by Iraq, the international community decided we're going to give Iraq one final opportunity. We know about the defiance. We know about the lies. We know about the, the deceit. We know about the subterfuge. We know about the threats that the government has out there. They have threatened individuals. They, they threaten individuals. They kill individuals. We know about all that. And our belief was that the only way that inspectors were going to be able to get at the truth was if they had a chance to talk to people who were going to be in the program and not talk with people who were minders in the room. If you're a convicted, if you're a con, if you're accused, if you're a defendant in a case, the prosecution isn't entitled to sit in there and listen to you talk to your lawyer. That's a basic safeguard. But what the Iraqi government has insisted is that people from their national, their national minders group have to sit in, in those interviews. 
They have coached their scientists on what to say. Saddam Hussein has said if they deviate, they die. Not only do they die, their children die. Their relatives die. So when the international community met to come up with a peaceful way, they said, this is not acceptable. This is the only inspection, intrusive inspection regime of its sort. Hopefully, this model won't have to ever be used again. But it was, it was designed to be intrusive. It was designed to give the inspectors wide-ranging powers because it is the alternative to the use of force. On the second question, um, our own behavior. Just remember, um, 10 years ago, we had 28,000 nuclear weapons. Now we're building down from 10,000. Just a couple of weeks ago, we eliminated yet another class of, of nu nu tactical nuclear weapons. We are destroying our chemical weapons uh, stocks. We are not engaged in offensive biological weapons research. We are building down. We are meeting our obligations under the variety of treaties. And we're doing it in a way that's pretty transparent to the American people and to the rest of the world. On the question of UN dues, I happen to be the de principal deputy assistant secretary of state and all that when we started paying. And so I'm proud that we got paid up. And I'm back again, and we're paying up again. But you know, it's up to you. If you want to vote for people who, who are going to support it, and, you, and, and Maryland has, but you've got to persuade the other 49 states, because it wasn't the administrations that were, that were holding up the money. It was, it was the Congress of the United States that didn't appropriate, put restrictions on that couldn't be met. And we are, we are a nation of laws. Sometimes the laws cut the wrong way. But the, this, this administration has stood up for its treaty obligations, and we're paying again. So uh, we just paid our peacekeeping um, uh, defi deficit or whatever uh, dues. Well, I'm going to make a lot of enemies tonight. I'm very sorry. You've had your hand up for about 40 minutes, and I apologize to others as well. Uh, but we're going to have to bring this to a close. It's been an uh, exciting evening. And uh, it's, it's a profoundly important one to everyone. Uh, I think we've all enjoyed it very much, and we're grateful to you for sharing your, your views and knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.